Okay, hello everyone. Good evening or good morning or night according to whatever Wibbly Wobbly Tummy Wobbly you are invested in. And this is the Malaysian Wolfians panel. There's a big style of delay, but since we are time lost, we are not known to be to be precise anyways. Okay, first of all, I need to make sure. Has anyone, everyone here have watched Doctor Who or just coming here for a career? Because you're curious. Uh, yes? curious, I watched. You're curious, watched. you watched it. I watched season yeah. 10 and 11. Yeah, you do not skip Christopher Eccleston. Nobody skip nine. Every single one. I and a few of the audio books. Oh, that's nice. Okay, since not, uh, not all of you have watched Doctor Who, so let me explain a tiny bit about what is the Doctor. And with Doctor Who is basically a sci-fi drama BBC film, that British fiction, where, it's a, where this man is created in 1963 to present. So that means that it's been going on for 53 years. Um, it started off with the idea that it will be an education, ed educational sci-fi drama, which is where they, with the doctor and the companion, where we see the third world through their eyes, and it will travel to the future or to the past using the TARDIS. This is, that is the TARDIS. Can anybody tell me what the TARDIS is? Time in relative dimensions in space. Thank you. That is not because I completely forgot what TARDIS stands for. <laughs> you know, just in case you guys got that. Free round trip ticket to Gallifrey. Yeah, if, if you can find it, we'll make sure we, we'll send you there. Okay. So using the TARDIS, the Doctor will travel to any, to any place in time and space according to whatever he wants because he's a time lord, he can do whatever he wants. And their focus here is to make sure that every time the, picture, the episode is going to the future, it will be about, it will be about, it will be about learning about science and discovery and, and, uh, and everything. And whenever he goes to the past, he will be learning about, more about history. So that's the concept of Doctor Who when it was created. Now it has evolved after, after 53 years to, to be more about learning about the sense of bewilderment, bewilderment of discovering everything and appreciating our history while also appreciating ourselves. Because the Doctor and the Copian, they do not just become bystanders whenever they travel. Because whenever they travel, there will always be something off about that place. <laughs> Because there's actually an explanation to why that happened, but I shall not spoil it for you guys. But that, but since then, the doctor, even though he's a time god, where he take a bow to never interrupt anything in time and space, he actually interrupts all the time. That's <laughs> it's, true. It's, it's, what true. it's what he does. So the, so the, the show is about true. how you as a person with, with the power, with the power of time and space, and what you can do, even though you don't have any superpowers. The doctor, the doctor is just a time doll, which is basically an overglorified human who have two hearts and nothing else. Or maybe a sonic screwdriver, which is a, I guess. The sonic screwdriver. Okay. Um, so that's basically the concept of the doctor who and the drama, because the, the doctor is the one who will be in charge of time, time travel and space, and the companion will be the one we see that the, will be seen will be more related to because. Well, it's more of a human and a very good-looking woman most of the times. Uh, give it to Douglas. Uh, th thank you all very much, and it's a pleasure to meet you all. Um, now, we're going to talk, I'm here to talk a little bit about the history of the doctors, and also to discuss a little bit about regeneration and the companion. I'm going to be talking both in-show and meta, so, uh, but I won't spend a lot of time only because we have a small amount of time, but also I'm sure you don't want to see some clown up on stage dancing and talking the whole time. Now, how is the show 50 years old? That's a good question. How on earth do you keep one show going for 50 years and still keep it new and different? Now, there's one thing that the doctor has managed to do very well. That is, um, he, we had a way of making sure it never gets old. Oh, and I use my sonic screwdriver, it actually affects it. Okay, so who would, uh, just for your information, there had been 12 doctors over the past 52 years. That's more than we had bonds over the last 50 years. Uh, a recent movie had made it technically 13, uh, we call it 12 plus 1. But, now one thing I want to make a point of, if you're new to Doctor Who, a lot of people will have their own favorite doctor. Whenever we talk about Doctor Who, we we'll always say, oh, who's your doctor? Uh, can anyone scream out their favorite doctor? The tenth! The tenth! Nine! The tenth! Nine. Four! Four! four. four. Ten. Okay, we got a four. Ten. Ten. Eleven. Uh, we got a ninth here. Nine. So, 
And very, now the thing is, for a lot of people, it's like a favorite sports team or a favorite idol singer, whatever it is, it's very personal. Sometimes, a lot of time, it, the person you started off with, the first doctor you watched, but not always. Sometimes, it, like for me, my favorite is Patrick Trotton, the second doctor. I didn't feel close to him, but the first one I would grew up with was Tom Baker, the one with the long scarf, right? You like a jelly baby. <laughs> there is, however, no number one doctor. All of them are great, and I can say honestly, I love every single one of them. Now, I'm just going to take it quickly through an introduction to something so you can see them. Uh, here's the first doctor. Started off in 63. Actually, the first show started the day after John F. Kennedy was shot. I'm not kidding, the day after. And it was pretty scary. And he had a doctor who was like this. And he was quite a, quite a bit of a grumpy old fellow. And he always went, hmm, hmm, you think so, hmm? <laughs> well, then maybe you should go call the police then. You'll look stupider than you even do now. But he uh, showed that he was actually a kind, compassionate old man and could be a bit of a mischievous imp. But at the, basically what happened was the actor began to grow old and they had to replace him. And replace him they did with this gentleman, my favorite one, uh, Patrick Trotton. He was, uh, they called him a bit of a cosmic hobo. And he was always kind of like, in fact, he, would, he reminded me a lot of the 11th Doctor, always bumbling and, oh, dearie, dearie me, oh, my kitty aunt. Why did you allow yourself to be subjected to freezing? You don't have to answer that if you don't want. <laughs> and he traveled around. He put a bit more fun and mischievousness into the Doctor. And then, after a few years of him, we went to this Doctor, the Dandy Doctor. And he had curly hair and he was very serious and very sarcastic he could be. But he was also a bit of a martial artist. Anyone who fought against him found that he could uh, put up a known in a fight. Oh, and he loved talking about the reversing the polarity of the neutron flow. I uh, reversed the polarity of the neutron flow, yes. And moving right along, after him came a very iconic doctor. Now, until David Tennant, this, for many people, was Doctor Who. He was on for so many years, seven years to be exact, that for many people, when they thought of Doctor Who, they thought of this man. And he was a very large, very tall man, actually, and very vocal. Yes, I am, aren't I? I'm the Doctor. <laughs> and so, and would you like to have a jelly baby, please? Yes. And so he himself could be that. He could be very vocal and he would very, I would say for the third floor doctor, very, very proud of themselves. Very confident. Very, very, very confident. Uh, for example, you may be the doctor, but I am the doctor. It's a thing that's <laughs> helpful, you might say. And after he retired, we went to someone a bit more, how would I say, low key, laid back. And he was played by Peter Davison, the fifth doctor. Now the fifth doctor was a bit more soft paced, he was a bit more soft voice. But I would say that actually he was also a very dramatic doctor. He had people leave him, he had people die on him. It, it was a very tragic story, the story of the fifth doctor. And in one of the audiobooks, uh, one of the old companions said, I'm glad you changed because the doctor I knew spent too much time crying. And now I'm going to think about Davison. He, his doctor went through a lot of pain, and he started out with a painful start and ended with a painful start. But despite that all, a lot of people still claim him as their favorite doctor. Including, by the way, one, do you know who called uh, Davidson their favorite doctor? David Tennant, the fifth doctor. Then he married his daughter. The next doctor was the sixth doctor, and if you want to talk about going from quiet and subdued to loud and obnoxious, well, this was the loud and obnoxious doctor. He also liked to wear a coat that had every single color under the universe in it. He started off his regeneration by strangling his companion. I kid you not. The first thing he did was try to kill his companion. And he was very cocky, very brash, and didn't mind telling everyone exactly what he thought. 
so I, I don't know all the best quote of him, but he would say, Oh, I know perfectly well what manner of catastrophe we've gotten ourselves into. Oh, feel sorry for yourself, you'll just die in a few weeks. I have to die, regenerate and keep dying coming back. Feel sorry for me. Moving on to the seventh doctor. Uh, another favorite of mine. The seventh doctor would play a switching from the slowly going to the younger doctor to an older one. So Dr. McCoy doctor was actually uh, a very scheming doctor. All the doctors in their own way can scheme, plan, and lay out plan, but none of them did it as well as this gentleman. And you may think that he's a bumbling oaf and that he's just stumbling around his feet, but the next moment you're caught in a trap that he's been setting up since the beginning of the episode. Have pity on me, doctor. Oh, I do pity you, Davros. Goodbye, Davros. It hasn't been pleasant. He's uh, very uh, self-assured, and he was very much a father figure. Next. Now, after a period of time, when uh, the doctor went off the air, and they tried to bring it back through a movie, and the movie starred a man named Paul McGann. Now, until recently, a recent movie brought him back. The uh, sad thing is Paul McGann only had the movie in the audio drama, but he proved himself to be a great actor. Paul McGann was more of the dashing, Englishman kind of type. Running around, being the proper gentleman. He was the gentleman doctor. And uh, he, always, uh, he was very flamboyant, very much I think of a musketeer, cavalier kind of uh, doctor. And then after a small break again, they brought him back to TV. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, pause there. I'm going to have to take a small outer because who came, who did they bring back on TV? The doctor. Yeah, the doctor. <laughs> but played by a man named Eccleston, the ninth doctor. But if we can go to the next one, we actually have a middle uh, before. The doctor, yeah. We actually have one that came out, apparently, they didn't tell us, there was a doctor between the eighth and the ninth. So he's like eight and a half. The war doctor, played by the actor named John Hurt, a very, uh, well, when we get to see him, he's very old, very tra he's a very tragic figure, and he knows that he's about to do something that may kill his whole planet. So he's very broken. And a, a very interesting doctor, and they're still writing stories about him now. But after him, and the renewal of the series, saw this gentleman, the ninth doctor. And for a lot of people, this was the first doctor they got to know. Yeah. That's Eccleston. true. I started with him. Yeah. One of the first lines they heard from him was, Hi, I'm the doctor. You? I'm Rose. Hi, Rose. Run. Run for your life. Run for your life, yes. Uh, very much, as far as I'm concerned, very much uh, a throwback to the old doctors. Very uh, verbose and in your face. He was still scarred heavily, though, by the Time War, which saw the death of the people. He was the last of the Time Lord, and it weighed heavily on him. And it took a while for him to get out of his shell, but eventually he did, and saw that he had a great sense of humor and sarcasm. After he died, we only had him for one year. We had the Tenth Doctor. And the Tenth Doctor, um, was played by a man named Tava Tennant. Now I said to everyone here, Alonzi. Alonzi? Alonzi. It's the Alonzi doctor. Alonzi doctor. Well. Yes. Well. well. But um, well. the interesting thing was, poor Eccleston only lasted one year. And I told you that Tom Baker was the definitive doctor for many years. Modern age, for a lot of people, he's become the definitive doctor. He was dashing, handsome, and very much a ladies' man. And a lot of people cried from the simple word. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And if you know you're a Hoovian, you know you're a Hoovian if when you hear, I don't want to go, and you start crying. <laughs> the 11th oh, Doctor. Oh, here we go. Stay very happy. The 11th Doctor, Max Smith. The youngest doctor yet. Youngest doctor yet. A lot of energy and a lot of enthusiasm. And he, he beat both high school. 
You make your tie very cool, and you make Fez's cool too. There's nothing you can't make cool. Exactly. And uh, one of the big things was that in all of that energy, he also had inside him where he could look like he was a very old man. At times, you would look in his eyes, and you could almost see Cardinal, the first doctor, inside his eyes. I remember one of my favorite lines from him was, I either let this ship go, or I kill this, kill this uh, being here. And when I do that, I'll have to change my name, because I won't be the doctor anymore. He very much understood what the consequences of his action was, and spent a lot of time trying to go and fix them. And after he left, we had our current doctor, the 12th doctor, Peter Capaldi. Another very bombastic and an actor who has quite a regimen under his uh, under, uh, acting acronym. He's done many things, all the way from uh, the Cardinal, Rich Lou, down to George Harrison. He played George Harrison. And he was one of the doctors who showed up on Doctor Who before he was a doctor. Uh, he, I love him very much, as many people do. Fits in great. Now let's go on, because I don't dwell, I can't dwell too long on here. I just want to talk about regeneration. Why do we have regeneration? The reason is simple. At one point, at one point, during the original series, uh, the people, the producers were having a problem. As cute as it was to watch Hartnell on TV, this man here, this man here, as cute as it was to watch him on TV, he was losing his memory. A lot of the dodge reacting he was doing was because he couldn't remember his line. The note that you saw left throughout the uh, show was him leaving his mind all over the show, and his health wasn't allowing him to. What do you do? This is a great show. People love it. They want to see more. But the main character, the actor, can't continue. So at one point, what they said was, well, he's an alien, isn't he? What do you say if he get killed, he can regenerate into a new form, a new personality? Which is exactly what they did. So you can see here, this is, uh, now, I'm going to not spend too much time here, but the doctors, you can see there's the first doctor. On his first regeneration, all the way up to here. Although, near, recently, uh, two years ago, the doctor used up all of his regeneration. A Time Lord only had 13. But this allowed him to, but the, the Time Lord gave up the power and sent him a new lifespan. This is something they were offering the master uh, at another time, but they gave it to the doctor this time. Um, let me check. Uh, May I ask if the character was so popular, how come they just limited that lifespan? I, I think they didn't think that it was going to go on much longer than that. <laughs> I think no one thought at the span of three years, at uh, another 12 regeneration, how, what are the chances of the people still watching the show in 50 years? That's not going to happen. <laughs> Both of <on> them. Uh, <laughs> so why is the regeneration popular? Is there a next slide? Okay, what I want to get across here, it, it is important when someone cannot continue, when the actor chooses not to continue, and there are many reasons. Health is one reason. Uh, sometimes it's about how they feel. Uh, a lot of people don't want to be typecasted. They want to move on. Uh, Eccleston, well, we're not going to go into that. There's a lot of theories on that, uh, including coming from him. But for some reason or another, an actor decides, I don't want to continue playing the doctor, or I can't. And when that happened, we have something in Doctor Who built in. James Bond, they change the actor, but they never say anything about it. In this case, when he critically entered, the doctor, physical appearance and personality changes. And so, the transformation into the second doctor, a figure who is basically the same character, but slightly different, actually shocked fans at the time. They'd never seen anything like that. And it was so different and yet so similar that the fans loved it. And it allowed, it took the show from possibly failing to actually being able to continue for 50 plus years. <laughs> continue? 
allowed for, what are the regeneration effects on the show? Allowed for the continuation of the show and keep the show unique and different. When a new doctor appears, just like the companion, they're going, everyone in the audience is going, well, look at this new guy like, why is he doing that? Why is he strangling a companion? Why is he talking to a dinosaur and calling her baby? <laughs> well, yeah. Why is he sitting up and talking to Santa Clauses? We don't know. The Peretta, we're not. The Brachiosaurus is very large but placid. Allow, and more importantly, and this is very important, we're talking about generation. Every generation likes to have their own band, their own group, their own favorite, favorite actor. If you try to have the same actor decade after decade after decade, people will feel a disconnection. With Doctor Who, even kids of today can say, keep my doctor. And that's something that matters a lot. And, uh, and they say that Bond changes, but they don't explain it. Now some Bond fans say, well actually it's not the act, it's not Joel Match that they're changing it for no reason. James Bond in 007 is just a title. And it's given to the best agent at the time, and that's why they change different people. But it's never addressed in the film, and the show it is. Uh, Multi-doctors, uh, specials, are something else that's an off-cast. It just makes it more fun. Uh, imagine bringing several doctors back, and, uh, and a lot of times when you get superheroes together in the old series, they go along well. And, well, not so much in the Avenger, but in Doctor Who, they never get along. They always yeah. argue with themselves. Companion. I won't take long, but I just want to touch briefly on companions. Can we go to the next slide, please? Here's, I want to quote a show called, uh, uh, one of the episodes called The Next Doctor, which was a red herring. Could everyone wonder, are they changing doctors already? A quote from the end of it was a man saying, tell me one thing, all those facts and figures I saw of the doctor's life, you were never alone. All those bright and shining companions? Not anymore? No. Might I ask why not? They leave? Because they should? Because they find someone else? And some of them, some, some of them forget me. So in the end, they break my heart. Next slide, please. Are companions necessary in Doctor Who? Yes. Yes! yes. yes. Big yes! <laughs> Next. These act as the POV, the point of view. That's why they were created in the first place, so that people can identify with them. The Doctor is an alien, a very old one. We can't possibly fully understand the Doctor. All we know is that he's a good guy, he's the valiant white knight who rides into your town, right all the wrong, defeats the baddies. But we, in the end, we don't know a lot more about him. We can't understand him, but we can understand a companion. Ask the question, that the doc, uh, to the doctor that the rest of us want to ask. Well, what, doctor, why are you doing that? Well, doctor, why would they want to do that? Have the reputation of running down hallways and screaming, doctor, a lot. <laughs> Encourages the doctor a lot, especially when he's down and lonely, and been known to inspire and actually give valuable input when needed. That's the one thing. When doctor can't figure it out, it's usually the companion who does. And it's not uncommon for the companion, indeed, to save the doctor from time to time. And that for every doctor case. Next. While the doctor changes occasionally, so do the companion. Then bring drama, in many cases, and also bring the welcome change. And if you want to talk about drama, if you don't know Doctor Who and you want to know that the changing companion bring drama, I'll just say one word, Rose. Oh! Some companion, Amy. Amy too, <laughs> Amelia Pond, uh, some companion become just as memorable as the doctor himself. K9, Sarah Jane Smith, and Rose Tyler are very good examples of this. Some think a companion is just a sexy human lady running around and bringing her help. But that's not really the case, Sarah folks. Jane Smith. <laughs> a very good example. We have main old companion. Ian, Ben, Jamie, Adric, to name a few. Helpless? Barb, look at some of these people. Barbara was a school teacher and a very smart one who challenged the doctor constantly. Leela was a cave woman. Cave woman warrior. 
Tegan was a very, she was brought in to be the uh, fly in the doctor in ointment, and she was. Nisa, very strong will. Ace, anyone ever seen Ace? Okay, picture a, a girl with a leather jacket on and her hair done back, and she beat up a Dalek with a baseball bat. Okay, Rose, Amy, Clara, Madame Vestra. I don't think anyone can outfight Madame Vestra with a sword. <laughs> Young, Barbara and Ian, Wilfred Mott, who is the grandfather, Donna Noble, River Song, and Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart, who uh, arguably could be considered the longest running companion of all time. Not to mention, changeling robots, robot dog, lizard women, and other time lord. Ah, I need to do a robot dog somewhere in there. Yeah. Can I run? Can I run? All right. All right. Next, relationship with doctor. They can be in many things. It could be a relative, like a granddaughter. A friend, an associate, like a steward. Like a, uh, Patton, like Stuart was, the brigadier. Stowaway, Ben started off as a stowaway. Could be a fellow time lord, like Romana. Traitor, who turned friend. Turlo was a traitor. He was supposed to betray the fifth doctor. Uh, daughter or son figure. Uh, Ace. Abbott became, looked up to the doctor and the father. Or, the doctor kidnapped them. <laughs> <laughs> That's how the show begins. Uh, more recently, in the recent redone, is Rose Tyler, a lover, and even the wife, River Song. And apparently, Elizabeth I and Marilyn Monroe, too, but we won't go into that. Uh, <laughs> just like the doctor, most people are going to have their own favorite companion. Can we hear your favorite companions? Rose! 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 Donna! Rose! I like Rose! Donna! Donna! Sarah Jane Smith! Uh, Rose! Donna, Donna. Very nice. Not, not everyone's shouting just one name, so that's good. It is actually just like the doctor and very passionate and named a lot to them. This was Paradise and one episode called Full Reunion, where the 10th doctor has his current companion Rose and an old companion, Sarah Jane, and they're both arguing about who had the most appearances. Uh, and the new companion appears this Christmas, introducing Pearl Mackey as Bill. And there's never been a more feminine name than Bill, may I say. <laughs> and with that said, all I can say is, I'm, I hope I haven't taken too long, and thank you very much. Okay, so this might that be the part where a lot of you are waiting for, the monsters of Doctor Who. Okay, so Doctor Who is known for its huge collection of monsters, uh, all made by enormously talented prop makers over in the UK. Um, here I'm just going to just some of them, four of the most iconic monsters ever to face Doctor Who. We're going to start with the Cybermen. Cybermen are basically uh, cyborg brains where they rip them out of actual normal people and put them in a completely robot body and they have no more emotions uh, and but they do have the ability to um, completely upgrade themselves and assimilate any technology they come across which is they're forever upgrading themselves making themselves better as that is their only goal during their original premiere during the original episode of doctor who it freaked out a lot of people. They only know hate. They were originally a race of aliens called the Kavadans, which were, uh, by the creator, they were locked into these robotic death machines, where they only know pain and hate. Silence are uh, creations, actually, that basically, if you see them and you look away or you blink, you will never remember they were there. And the only way to beat them is by writing on your hand that you actually met the silence. They are one of the most terrifying creatures uh, in Doctor Who because they have been around since the dawn of man, influencing humanity in every decision they make. Because like, uh, they'll tell you, they'll command you to do something, you'll do it and you'll never remember that they were there. They have also the weird power to shoot lightning from their mouth. The Weeping Angels are a very unique kind of monster because uh, they can only move if you look at them. That's why the whole title of the episode was Don't Blink. If you blink, they will move. And they can cross huge distances in... Well, a place. So, okay, the Weeping Angels are an enormously dangerous species of monster. Nobody knows where they can come from. Even the doctor doesn't know. 
Uh, they normally disguise themselves as a normal statue. Uh, they even become the Statue of Liberty. For some reason, I don't know why. Moffat. But, yeah, Moffat. 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 They can't Moffat. Yeah. They are, um, if they touch you, they, they will send you back in time to maybe a, a different time, like in the, uh, let's say it was now, they're sending back into World War II or World War I, where they will feed off your potential life energy of the life that you could have lived. That's why they are the only monsters to kill you recently, where you will live out your life, but they will, that this technique is still killing you. That's why they are incredibly tragic, but very, very iconic uh, monster about them. Also, they, if you look at them, any image of the weeping angel is also an angel. Over to our guru, the Doctor Who guru. So, uh, in case you guys don't know, this panel is brought to you by the Malaysian Movians. So, a few years ago, someone who's not yet Nazarene actually started the group and uh, they did some events and all that and you might have noticed a pickup sometime last year. It's mostly uh, because we have one very crazed fanatic of the show here who just wants everyone to become a Hoobie. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and our guru. So uh, I just want to talk a bit about what this, uh, what this whole thing is about and what I'm really trying to do with this. I'm not trying to take over the world. So this is some of the events that, uh, some of them that we have been doing and um, just kind of like spottings of movies <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> so we can see did a, we did a uh, picnic, uh, I think a year ago, was it? Uh, and uh, we did a couple of, yeah, two years ago, we did a couple of meetups uh, at Nazarene's place. And we also went to GeekCon. But what I like to point out is that there are actually other cosplayers like this guy here. Uh, who is cosplay character from Doctor Who, and that turns up in content stuff. And especially in the uh, 2016, is a huge year for geeks. I mean, how many movies are there out for us this year? You're starting to see a pickup of non-anime manga kind of uh, pop culture in Malaysia, geek culture, so to speak. So I feel it's a great time to try and push the pedal on Doctor Who a little bit. Now. The whole, the whole point of this is because Doc, Doctor Who stands out as a very unique show for all the reasons that these guys have given. But it's one of the few shows which the protagonist tries very actively not to harm people to save the day. If he really can. You know, uh, today everybody lives. He tries. And that's why I try to push the show to as many people as I can. Because in a, in a day and age where Life is becoming more difficult, more the world more hopeless. A lot of us literally bought to a gadget. There is something optimistic to look out for. And uh, Doctor Who to me is one of those standout shows which if you see someone wearing or doing a boobian thing, you can spot him from really far away. Funny story, you guys know me in Valley, right? Yeah. Do you know the top floor in front of Yoshinoya? Yeah. yeah. So I was standing on one side of that space. And I saw across the like empty space another guy wearing this shirt, and then I just We're shouted at him. Hello, Zig! He shouted it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny. He just walked out and was like, "Oh, you're Ruby too? Oh, yes, yes, yes." And then, uh, then I said, "We have a Facebook page. We have a Facebook page." And uh, so this is where I show you guys this. Uh, so I'm the guy who pushed using the social media more. We have a few people helping me out, but uh, I'm really a bit of a nut with that. I know what the doctor says about Twitter, but we have it all anyway. So um, this is also a kind of thing to try and get all of you to know how to do. And because, like, everyone who watches Doctor Who later seems to think that they're alone. Every single person I've met is one. But uh, just so you know that we've got a page. So what the first thing I did when I got back to Malaysia a couple of years ago was find every single Facebook page for Doctor Who. Talk to all the admins and merge into one page. So yay, we're one page now. So this is the group that was started by Nazarene and pretty much I think it's the only group out there which is why I kind of like jumped on board and travel a little bit. So our group as you can see, actually no you can't see it from here, but if you look on the uh, Facebook page we've got hundreds of people in there, which is kind of huge if you think about it. In two years we picked up that many people and that's a pretty fast growing community. There's likely many more out there. Then there's our Twitter page which very few people use. but. I actually found some movies out there on Twitterverse. Do uh, you guys know about Twitch underscore Malaysia? No. The Twitch Malaysia. Twitch Malaysia is this uh, curator account. I will watch that every week. And sometimes that person is a movie and just ask them to retweet everything. <laughs> then we have an Instagram as well. Which some people suggest.
next to the startup, so I started up anyway because it's location discoverability and all that. So yeah, that, these are the main things I've been using. We do have a couple more as well, but uh, very rarely use it like Tumblr or anything. So yeah, um, please join us if you haven't already.